Welcome everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Welcome everyone to another edition of the Peaceful Solution Character Education Teacher Certification Course. If you're joining us uh, overseas or here in the United States, wherever you might be here in the, at the Peaceful Solution headquarters, you can be seated. Thanks for joining us. I know it's, I don't know if you can see uh, the sweat dripping off me. It's pretty hot here in Texas today. We've been having some really hot weather and I, I think I've seen nothing but hundreds in the future. So I guess we better get used to it. Um, we're going to be picking up where the last teacher, uh, Chris, left off tonight. We're in chapter uh, five, maintaining your self-control. And I'm gonna, we're gonna be rehearsing some of that before we move on to the next portion. Um, <clears throat> my portion tonight will be on page 140, drugs and alcohol. But now, if you're watching online, don't forget, you can, you can follow along in the book by clicking on the link at the top of the Facebook page. There's a drop-down menu that has all the books there. We're in the self-control manual. We're going to be picking up on page 140. And if you're, uh, don't forget too that we also uh, are streaming now live. Uh, I believe it's peacefulsolution.org, and there is a uh, there's a button there at the top that shows live streaming, so you can join us on that uh, form of media as well. Okay, so we're going to be picking up on page one. 40, as I said, but before we do that, we're going to be reviewing a little bit about what we went over last time. Chris talked about many issues uh, that he told us were hot button issues, uh, and it's hot today, so that'll add to the heat. <laughs> um, but he was talking about there's two sides to every coin on page 138, and uh, it is a hot button topic because you know these are this is reality this is what the world is dealing with this is what the students in the in the junior high and the high schools you know this is what they're dealing with on an everyday basis you know whether it's uh, peer pressure whether it's uh, uh, teen pregnancy drugs alcohol etc you know uh, things going on at home you know domestic violence uh, and basic dysfunction at, in the home setting these are the things that everyone's dealing with. As we learned in the, in the second unit, the acceptance unit, it talked about dysfunctional families. You know, everybody has a level of dysfunction in their family. I don't remember, was that the first? That might have been even the character unit. I think it's in the character unit, chapter two. It talks about func functional and dysfunctional families. And all families have some level of dysfunction. There's no perfect family, okay? Uh, and why? Not everyone's been taught the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program where they know how to resolve the different issues that come up in their lives, you know, uh, correctly or perfectly yet. So until they're taught, they're always going to have this struggle. And but they're, you know, a lot of families do the best they can with what they know, you know, what, what their parents taught them, what they learned from their religious teachers or whoever their influences are in their life. They do their best, okay, uh, to guide the children in the right direction, okay, and that includes the teachers in the schools as well. So Chris was talking about there's two sides to every coin, and it says at the top, peer pressure can influence you in both positive and negative ways. How you are influenced depends on two things, your character and values, and the character and values of the people you choose to be around, okay? And remember, who you choose to be around. And we learned in the last unit, in the, acceptance unit, in the acceptance unit, about choosing friends. Okay, and what a friend actually is. So whenever you see the word friend here, it's not going to be somebody that's trying to get you to do something that, you know, is morally wrong. That's going to bring harm to you, your neighbor, the environment, okay, or somebody else says, in other words, if someone values being accepted more than developing a positive character, they're going to be more susceptible to negative peer pressure. And that's what we see today. Now, how many children do you think are out there in the middle school thinking right now? Well, they're not even in middle school. They're in summer break. But how many children do you think are on summer break wait, thinking, I can't wait to get back to school where I can get that moral education? 
Do they even know what that is? They don't even know what the word moral means. Okay, so, you know, again, the teachers do the best they can with what they know, but the teachers have got their hands tied behind their back. We know, we deal with the teachers. And the teachers, a lot of the times, will say, you know, I'm busy teaching math, I'm busy teaching science, I'm busy teaching social studies. I don't have time for something else to be put on my plate. I'm already too busy. But then we've had some other teachers that figured out how to incorporate it in their in their classrooms. You know, like I had a teacher in Laredo, Texas, that was a science teacher. And what she decided to do, she got permission from her principal. Uh, she loved the peaceful solution, how it was working for her son. So she went to the principal of her school and she said, I'd like to teach this program, you know, for 20 minutes in the morning before we start the lesson for the day, you know, the science lesson. Her principal agreed and she started doing it and within two or three weeks the other teachers in the school were asking her why are your children so much better behaved than our children and that was her opportunity to share with them what she was doing you know it wasn't something that you had to teach you know two hours or three hours out of your day but you know you teach the lesson for 20 minutes in the morning and then throughout the day you inf you you uh, what we would call uh, reinforce the lessons, you know, like remind the students what they learned when little issues come up in the classroom. You can always go back and remind them what they learned that morning because miraculously, usually something will come up that day that they just read about that morning, okay? And it's to test them to see if they're going to do, if they're going to put into practice the things that they learned in the lesson that day. But you know what? It's in their mind. That's the important thing. It's in their mind. So if it's in their mind, they're going to be prepared for those things that come up. If we don't put these things in their mind that are taught in the peaceful solution, how to resolve conflicts, how to deal with bullies, how to deal with the teasing and the whatever else goes on, the negative peer pressure to get them to do things that they shouldn't do, if we don't put these techniques and things in their mind, they're not going to know how to handle it. So they're going to get, they're going to, they're going to be tested, but they're going to fail because they don't know what what to do to resist those negative influences so uh, peers can be a positive influence when they encourage each other to practice self-control and to be honest respectful and responsible and you do see that you do see that sometimes in children in school you know where there's somebody bullying somebody and they they, they might be being bullied and some child comes up to him and says hey don't 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 fight back you know don't 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 say anything, you know. Two wrongs don't make a right, or it's just going to make it worse. Just don't just just go tell the teacher, or just but don't retaliate. Sometimes there's children that do that, you know. And uh, so anyway, let's go and continue. I want to. Chris was talking about decision making and how on page. Let's go to look at page 139. He was talking about risk taking behavior like premarital sex, use of illegal drugs, and underage drinking. That's what I'm going to get into tonight is the illegal drugs. But he talked a little bit about premarital sex on page 139. And it says in the middle paragraph, children who are born to unwed mothers are more likely to be neglected and physically, mentally, and emotionally abused. Now, this is talking about uh, unwed mothers, whether they're teenagers or even in their later years. Because teens are not emotionally or financially prepared to deal with the stress of raising a child, Many unwanted pregnancies end in abortions. And, you know, I saw a lot of that growing up myself. You know, in fact, I was in the middle of something like that when I was younger. I didn't, I didn't encourage anyone to get an abortion, okay? In fact, I encouraged them not to do so. But, you know, you, we can only encourage, but we can't force people to do things. People have to make their own choices. But that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about tonight before we go into the drugs. I want to hit on this thing about choices, all right? And I want to remind us, I want to go back to the character unit and kind of put a few pieces of this puzzle together because, you know, you always hear about pro-choice. You know, you hear people say pro-choice when it comes to abortion. And we agree. We agree that everyone should make a choice. Everyone should be free to choose. But... We also believe in order to make a perfect choice or what's called a decision or a judgment, a perfect judgment or decision, you have to be shown both sides of the coin. 
you have to be given, you know, uh, the schools like to kind of call it critical thinking techniques, you know, where you sit there and you look at the pros and the cons, as they call it. Children need to be taught the rewards that come for doing something and the consequences that can come from doing something. They need to be shown both sides, and many times they're not. And they're not able to make a perfect decision. So let's go ahead and put up that first slide just to re remind ourselves of something that we learned in the character unit on page 176. And it told us that basing your decisions on facts, not emotions, is what builds true moral character. You are better able to make a perfect decision when you gather all the facts than a person that only has a portion of the facts. So basing your decisions on facts, not emotions. You know, if a girl, a young girl gets pregnant and the young boy finds out, you know, there's usually fear involved, you know, because the child doesn't want the parents to find out. They don't want to disappoint their mother or their father. You know, you know, I've heard it, I've heard it said my dad will kill me if he found out I did this or my mom will she'll disown me if she finds out that I did something like this. I'm not ready for a baby, you know, or whatever whatever is going on in their mind when they find these things out. Remember what's going on is called emotion. There's emotions flying around in their mind. There's thoughts first, right? Thoughts lead to feelings, feelings lead to actions and actions lead to rewards and consequences. So the first thing is they think, oh no, I'm pregnant. You know, they find out that they're pregnant. And many times, like I said, they get scared. Or, you know, they might feel some other feelings too. In fact, let's turn back to page, let's turn back to page 31 in, this, in the book here. Let's look at some emotions. Let's look at some emotions that they might be feeling at the time. And I'm talking about negative emotions here on page 31. Um, they might feel, would you say they might feel ashamed? Like feeling shame or guilt that they're pregnant? Um, they might feel disappointed or embarrassed. They could feel guilt. Um, they could feel pessimistic about the situation, like looking at it like, oh no, this is the end of the world, you know. I'm never going to live this down, right? So they might not have hope for the future. They might think, oh, no, my world is at an end. You know, I've got this baby, and I'm only 14. What am I going to do? Chris told us the other night there was a girl, a 10-year-old, looking for a place to go have an abortion. 10 years old. Can you imagine that? At a time when children are normally that age are playing with dolls? <laughs> you know, one thing I noticed about children, young girls... I had sisters, I had three sisters, and I, I noticed they all liked to play with dolls, you know, they used to have dolls, and, and they would even have doll houses, and they would all get together and play with their dolls. You know, I, not, I, didn't, I never one time did I see them pretending they were uh, aborting a baby. I saw them nurturing the baby, trying to feed the baby, you know, I'm talking about, you know, a doll, right, or a little, you know, whatever they, whatever they call them. I never heard them talking about killing them. I always saw them trying to take care of them and learning how to, how to spoon feed them or whatever else they do, right? Change their diapers, right? But I never seen, seen them set up a mock abortion clinic and invite their friends over to kill their dolls. I never saw that. Never saw them even think about anything like that. So something occurred along the way, what we're going to talk about, okay? So I just wanted you to, they might also feel hopelessness and despair, having no expectation of a success, remedy, or a solution to the problem. So they think, oh no, what am I going to do? Well, you know, there's an abortion clinic, you know, uh, usually in every town, you know, and I don't know how much they charge. I think the last time I heard it's something like $500, right, where they can go, and in many cases nobody has to know, even their parents don't have to know, and they go to this clinic, and they have a medical procedure done, which I know in some states, I know they don't have to notify parents from what I understand. And it's kind of strange because even in a school, you know, if your child gets a headache, they usually have to call the parents to find out if they can give them an aspirin. 
So I'm not quite sure how they can get a medical procedure done without their parents being aware of it, okay? A medical procedure that could actually change their whole life and could actually even end in death. There's people that have died, there's women that have died in the process of getting abortions. And yes, I'm going to be talking about that a little bit because we got to get all the facts to be able to teach our students about these subjects. Let me go back to a uh, page where I just left off. Um, let's see. We we're on page 139. Go ahead and turn there, but I want to go to the next slide to remind you of something else. The first positive character trait we learned in the character unit is educated. And educated means getting all the facts and making sure those facts are correct or true before making a decision. Okay, now, you know, again, when people are making decisions on the fly or are based on emotions and not facts, not true facts, gathering all the facts to make sure they're correct, they usually always make a decision that's going to come back to haunt them later in their life. It's going to have consequences, whether they're long-term or short-term. There's always going to be consequences, and there's going to be regret because they didn't get the information or they weren't given the information that they should have been given. Our job, as what we need to teach our students is, we've got to get the facts about everything we learn. We've got to know everything about everything. We've got to learn. We've got to be a a fact finder. We've got to investigate. And we teach in the Peaceful Solution in the, in the uh, earlier units, we have lessons about being an investigator and, and asking the questions. We have a whole book about the word ask. Okay? Ask is one of the pillars of the Peaceful Solution. Asking. The importance of asking. Asking is how you gain knowledge. You know, you should never think, you know, well, I don't want to look stupid if I ask this question. You know, as they say, the only stupid question is the one you don't ask, right? So we need to be asking, asking. Asking helps us to gain knowledge, helps us to gain information that we need to make a perfect decision. Let's go to the next. Uh, oh, by the way, that was on page 14 of the uh, character unit. So let's go now to page or the next slide. It says... This is from the note to the student. Remember, I'm putting these little factoids in your mind to remember, so we can remember about the importance of gathering facts and not going on feelings or hearsay or whatever it is that we encounter. The note to the student on page one said, as you study this unit on character, you will be able to gather essential facts that will guide you to make right choices Remember right choices? A right choice is a choice that doesn't bring harm to you, your neighbor, or in the environment. Okay? So, it says, as you study this character unit, you're going to be able to gather essential facts that will guide you to make right choices that will, in turn, help you to develop a positive moral character. Are you seeing how important it is to get information, to gather facts? Remember, it's the first character trait in the book. We've got to gather the information. We've got to stress the students the importance of looking into things. I don't care what it is, whether it's abortion, whether it's drugs. You know, we hear so many people say, well, you know, that drug's not dangerous. You know, uh, you know, you know, it says in the Bible that God gave us every herb of the field, you know, or, you know, they say, uh, uh, you know, they, they come up with all kinds of <laughs> excuses to use these things, you know, well, why is it out in the woods, you know, if we're not supposed to use it, why is it just sitting there, you know, well, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of things, you know, there was a guy named Yule Gibbons, you know, he was, uh, he used to do those grape nut commercials when I was growing up, it was a breakfast food, and he, he'd, he'd come on the commercial, and he'd say, you ever eat an oak tree, many parts are edible, you know, and he'd tell you all about, you know, certain things you could eat out in the woods, but you know what, that man didn't eat everything in the woods, because if he did, he would be dead. Now, he did die. I don't hope it wasn't because of something he ate in the woods that he, that he wasn't aware of or he wasn't educated about. But, you know, there are things in the woods that you can eat, but there are also things in the woods, if you eat them, you will die immediately. <laughs> okay, so not everything was put out there for us to consume or smoke 
or in jest, you know, or in, in some form or fashion. Not everything. It has a purpose, but it's not for us to, to take it in our bodies. All right, so where was I? So these facts that we're gathering, you know, the, the main facts we're gathering are from the Peaceful Solution Program, from the Character Unit, the Acceptance Unit. Now we're in the Self-Control Unit. We're getting all these facts, okay? And we're also peppering these teachings with facts that we're grabbing from different sources that we've researched that we know. You know how we know it's detrimental? The results. The results. It's the results. You know? How many people do you have to see that use cocaine and overdose or have a, a financial problems? Or, you know, how many times do you have to see it before you understand, hey, that's a problem? You know? Using cocaine must not be very beneficial. Right? All right, so let's go to the next slide. This is from page eight of the, uh, that unit, of the character unit. It says, an immoral attitude toward life consists of behaviors that devalue, belittle, hurt, and take from others both emotionally and physically. Behaviors that include name-calling, teasing, bullying, and discriminating cause others to feel inferior and disregard their worth as human beings. Physically hurting others includes being aggressive and violent toward them. It also consists of behavior like violating, like rape, killing, kidnapping, or murdering. Those who have an immoral attitude toward human life often direct acts of cruelty toward those who are weaker or unable to defend themselves, as in the case of abuse towards children or the elderly or even babies, even unborn babies. You know, I think Chris brought up before, if it's if it's if it's not alive, why do we have to kill it? If it's not alive, why do you have to kill it? Abort, the word abort means to terminate something. Well, what are you terminating? Well, you're terminating the pregnancy. You're terminating the life of the baby. Okay? Can that baby defend herself? Does the baby have a say? broke one of my broke one of my first rules of the peaceful solution hey I'm teaching class right now you should tune in uh, peacefulsolution.org or you can go on Facebook I'm on live right now okay thank you sorry about that <laughs> hopefully they'll tune in okay so all right, where was I? <laughs> okay, I got to hit the reset button now because my mind just went to that phone call. So, anyway. Okay, yes, I was talking about how children, they can't defend themselves. They're weak, you know, and babies in the womb, they can't defend themselves. They don't have any say. But what do you think they would say if they were given a choice whether to be born or to be aborted? What do you think they would say if they could? Yeah, they would want to be born, man. They would want to live. They would want to live. They would want to experience life. In fact, they're already experiencing many things while they're in the mother. It's been proven fact that children can, can hear what's being said by the people that are outside their environment. They're in the mother's womb. They can hear the mother talk to them. They can experience, they can even experience the feeling that the woman feels that she's going through. They can hear the, out, the outside sounds, and they're probably pretty curious. They're probably thinking, man, I can't wait to get out there and see what's going on. Right? And then they end up in uh, some clinic where, as Chris described it, in some clinics, they're being scraped out of a woman and chopped to pieces. And, you know, I've heard them say it doesn't hurt, but how did they know? Have they ever been chopped to pieces? I would think being chopped to pieces would hurt. I would think having something stuck in the back of my skull, you know, to end my life would, would probably hurt. Some of those 
some of those abortions, they use uh, some kind of a saline solution, salt solution to burn the baby. They call them candy apple babies, where they burn them. They can become red from burning them, to kill them, to kill them, to terminate the life. You know, I'll bet you if the mothers, you know, these, these teen mothers, these teen girls, that, that if they knew all the things that I'm telling you right now, if they'd have been taught all these things before they made these choices, they wouldn't have made that choice. And I'm only scratching the surface right now. Let's go to the next slide. Now keep all these things in mind about choices. A negative choice is immoral. It has the potential to cause harm because it has no regard for anyone's life, life, property, or the environment. Life. You know, the Supreme Court justices in the Roe versus Wade case you know, what they did was they said, you know, we don't want to get into the thorny issues of what life is and when life begins and all that stuff. We don't want to deal with that. That's for the religious people to deal with. We're going to wash our hands of that. We're going to wash our hands of that argument. We don't want to take that up here. We're just saying that the 14th Amendment, what is it, the uh, uh, Equal Protection Clause and the Right to Privacy, uh, Nine justices on the Supreme Court. I think it was a five to four decision. I don't remember the numbers on the Roe versus Wade. But nine justices had an opinion. They all had an opinion. And Roe versus Wade was, became law because the majority opinion was, yes, uh, we see in the Constitution that a woman has a right to abort a baby. The other justices said there's no such thing written in here. So, because six people had an opinion, or five people had an opinion that said it's in there, and four people didn't, it became the law of the land. But let me ask you a question, and this is a question I always ask all the Peaceful Solutions students in my class. Just because the crowd is saying that it's okay, does that make it right? Just because the majority says something is okay, does that make it moral? And just because it's legal, does that make it moral? In fact, we're getting ready to talk about drugs and alcohol tonight. There's, you know, and I'm talking about alcohol over drinking alcohol. And if you're a teenager, you shouldn't be drinking it at all. But um, they are legalizing drugs in a lot of in a lot of states right now, including Washington D.C. I think the marijuana is legalized there. Now, the question becomes this. This is what you must ask yourself. Just because it's legal, does that make it moral? Does that make it something that doesn't bring harm to you, your neighbor, or the environment? Well, that's what you're going to have to figure out. You're going to have to study this. You're going to have to gather all the essential facts before you decide. Not just spout out what you heard somebody else say, you know, that's... It's like, it's like a parrot, like a parrot, you know, you keep hearing the same excuses that people use to justify their behavior. But when you, when you research, it doesn't really add up. So remember, a negative choice is immoral. It has the potential to cause harm because it has no regard for anyone's life, property, or the environment. Examples of this are teasing, lying, stealing, vandalism, bullying, abortion, and war. Why do we say war? War brings, br war brings harm to life, property, and the environment. <laughs> so how could war be a moral thing? Think about it for a minute. And I've heard men, grown men, grown world leaders say things like, it's a morally justifiable war. But the word moral itself is taught by the peaceful solution. Moral means it doesn't break the rules and it doesn't bring harm to anybody. It's harmless. War is not harmless. War brings harm not only to the, you know, think about it. We got combat veterans that come back from these different places they've been sent, and they're damaged. Even if they didn't get shot by a bullet, they come home and their brain is damaged. They have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, where because they've been in a situation you know, where they're seeing 
things that they shouldn't see. You know, they're seeing people's, you know, limbs being torn apart. They're seeing people's heads being blown off. They're seeing blood and guts everywhere. No human being should ever have to see that. And in many cases, they're the ones that are shooting the other person. And they don't really want to do it. They don't really want to do it. I remember Timothy McVeigh, you know, the Oklahoma City bomber. I remember uh, they did a, uh, they did an, uh, they did a, uh, I think it was 60 Minutes program on CBS. They did an interview with him before they executed him uh, when he was on death row. And they asked him, why did you do this? Like, why did you, he blew up the, the, the Murray, the Murray uh, I think the Fred Murray building, I think it was called, the, uh, in Oklahoma City, it was a courthouse. He killed like 168 people with a truck bomb. And uh, they asked him why he did it, and he said, you know, I don't understand why they want to kill me right now, why they want to send me to the death chamber. He said, I don't understand it. He said, when I was in, when I was in Desert Storm, I was sent to Desert Storm in Iraq, and I was a highly decorated soldier. I was highly decorated for killing people. He said, the United States highly decorated me for killing people. And now they want to kill me because I killed somebody. And I thought about what he said. I said, the man has a point. Now, does that make it right? No. But in his mind, he was like, I don't understand. You taught me to kill. But now when I killed some of my some of our own people, I'm being killed for it. Okay, so the man saw the hypocrisy that was going on. He saw it. He saw, because you know, you know what made him snap, he said, was when he had to point a gun at somebody for the first time and he had to shoot them. When he was in the war, you know, he was facing the enemy and he, you know, the enemy had his rifle pointed at him and he had his rifle pointed at the enemy and it was like, hey, it's either him or me. But he said he shot the man and he felt horrible for doing it afterwards. He said he felt horrible. Why am I doing this? What am I doing here? He realized at that point, what am I doing? Like, what, what is this all about? He said, that man was just as scared of me as I was scared of him. That man wanted to go home too. He wanted to live too. I thought about that interview. I, I, I would recommend you go back and watch it if you can, if they still have it online. It's very interesting. Let's go to the next slide. This is a real shocker to me. I didn't know anything about these numbers. This is from Breitbart. This is from 12-31-2021. Uh, Abortion leading global cause of death in 2021 with 43 million killed. Did you know that? It says globally there were more deaths from abortion in 2021 than all deaths from cancer, malaria, HIV, AIDS, smoking, alcohol, and traffic accidents combined. 43 million worldwide, and that's just ones that were reported. That's staggering. That's a staggering amount of lives right there. Let's go to the next slide. Talking about negative choices. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. A negative choice is chosen out of ignorance or in haste. Now, that word ignorance, it means not being educated, not being aware. You don't know. You don't have all the facts. You didn't gather all the essential facts. Or it wasn't even offered to you. <laughs> it wasn't even offered to you. So you didn't even know what I'm telling you right now. They, didn't, they weren't offered the moral guidance. You know, their parents did the best they could. Okay, and in many cases, you know, their 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 preacher or their their Sunday school teacher or their uh, their imam or whoever it was they went to for some kind of moral guidance. Yeah, they they did what they knew. It says it's chosen out of ignorance or in haste, without getting all the facts to make an intelligent decision. Remember, you can't make a perfect decision unless you gather all the facts and make sure those facts are correct or true. You have to do that first. We got to stop believing everything we see on TV. We got to stop believing everything we're hearing on the radio. We got to stop believing everything we heard on that podcast last night. People are throwing opinions out there, like Supreme Court justices. They throw out opinions. Opinions are like eyeballs. Everybody has one or two. 
for the most part, right? But does that mean their opinions are true? That they're morally sound? That they're based on solid moral principles that you're learning here in the Peaceful Solution? Absolutely not. And just because they're a president or a, some kind of world leader or they, they run an agency, they run an agency. You know, I, I remember the woman that was running the Planned Parenthood agency a few years back. She was bragging, bragging that the number of abortions in their clinics had gone up during her tenure as president of Planned Parenthood. And this was a woman. I thought women wanted their, their first their first thing if a child was being hurt or a child was, you know, in some kind of danger, was there to protect them, you know, a woman. I would think a woman would want to grab that baby and protect that baby. But this woman was actually boasting that the numbers during her tenure had gone up in Planned Parenthood, that they had aborted more babies than ever. I don't know if that why, why someone would boast about such a thing, but she did. But, you know, making these choices without this information or making them in haste, you know, making them quickly, making a, making a decision too quickly, it's like flipping a coin and going, okay, am I going to get an abortion or not? We'll flip this coin. Well, oh, it's tails. Let's go. That's how silly it is. We've got to get make intelligent decisions, and we've got to get all the facts. We've got to make sure they're correct before we decide. Remember all these things we've been taught. Look at the next slide. This is from page 75 on the character unit. Part of growing up means developing my own values through my own studies. My own studies. Remember, this is junior high. My own studies. In addition to what I've been taught by my parents and teachers. In other words, we can't just believe everything we hear. Many things can influence what I value if I allow them to do so. Some of these influences can be negative. It's up to me to make obtaining a moral character my first and most important value. By doing this, I can then determine what influences can affect my character in a negative way. In other words, you're getting trained to discern between what's right and what's wrong or what your parents or teachers are saying that might, that might not be right. Because your parents, remember, they were taught too, right? They were taught by somebody, right? They had teachers, they had parents. So they're only teaching you what they know. Okay? And they do the best they can, but that doesn't mean they're right about everything they're telling us. Okay? So that means that we need to make sure that we... Check those facts out to make sure they're correct. That doesn't mean, you know, your parents tell you to clean your room and you tell them, well, I got to check the, you know, I got to check that out before I do this, you know, because uh, I'm not sure cleaning my room is something I should do. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay, don't get that in your head. Or I don't know if I should do those dishes, Mom. That might be bad for my hands. You know, soaking my hands in water too long, you know, might be bad for my health. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not talking about those kind of things. Okay. Do your chores, in other words. All right, go to the next slide. This is from page 75. It says, I can obtain a positive character by always considering what my values are and by imitating and practicing only those things that will not cause harm to others or myself. So you want to be a VIP? You want to be a, a values imitating and practicing? then you need to make, if you're doing it and you're practicing the peaceful solution and you're imitating the values taught in the peaceful solution, you're not going to be bringing harm to anybody or anything. You're not, not going to be doing it. That includes a baby, an, an, an unborn baby. You're not going to be doing any harm because you understand, you've been taught the moral values, that it means that you don't bring harm to anyone, especially those that are weaker than you that are trusting in you. They're trusting in you. They've been entrusted to you, those babies. You know, they've been entrusted to us. You need to look at it that way. Let's go to the next slide. Now, since Roe versus Wade in 1973 was decided, the schools have taught the children that abortion was legal and that they had the legal right to choose an abortion. But they did not instruct children on the difference between moral and immoral 
nor did they instruct the children regarding all of the negative long and short term consequences that come from the decision to abort a baby. All of the facts were not presented so the children could not make a perfect decision. This is not education as taught in the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program. That's not proper education. The Supreme Court only made a legal decision, but they didn't tell them in the schools, look, the court made it legal, but that doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it moral. Here's what moral means. Here's what immoral means. Okay? and teach them all the, the benefits that come from making the moral choice and all the consequences that come from making the immoral choice. Remember the immoral choice. I don't think I have to say anything else about that. I think I just wanted to remind you about the importance of the fact that, you know, how are people actually making a decision on an abortion, for instance. You know, think about it for a minute. Think about a 15-year-old girl that goes down to the clinic, okay? And she's scared. She's got the money from her boyfriend or whoever gave it to her. She's scared. She just wants to get this thing done. And then she's sitting in the abortion clinic, you know, and there's probably pamphlets, you know, in there, you know, and they might have even offered her a pamphlet. But you know what? Where's the guidance that that child needs at that moment? Where's somebody to tell her, hey, you know, here's all the consequences that you could face if you go through with this. You're going to go through post, uh, they call it post, uh, postpartum depression. The anniversary, you know, the anniversary date, you know, when they have an abortion, every year on that anniversary date of their abortion, they feel horrible. Because a lot of times they realize as they get older, I made the wrong choice. I should not have done that. And they feel guilt and shame. Not only that, women that get abortions develop breast cancer. Because when that fetus is taken from the woman, okay, the woman's body's like, you know, adapting to the baby. And when the baby's taken out of the body, the body's like, hey, where's the baby? <laughs> and the body starts, you know, doing certain things because it starts acting up because the baby's missing all of a sudden. It's not normal. So there's going to be a consequence in the woman's body. There's many, many, many things women suffer as a result. And it's not just the women that suffer. What about the boy that says, I don't want you to kill my baby? You know, we can figure out a way. You know, we can figure out how to handle this. You know, it's not the end of the world. You know, we can go to our parents, you know, we can ask, you know, how to fix this thing. We can, we can do something about it, right? And then the boy feels, you know, guilt and shame. I know, I was one of those boys. The boy feels like, you know, I don't even have a say in this. You know, that's my baby. And you're taking it and you're, you're going to give it to them and kill it. So it's not just the woman suffers that suffers the consequences okay and i'm gonna tell you right now i see all those people out there protesting and they got their signs you know a lot of those people are paid to be out there protesting <laughs> there's groups that are actually paying them to be out there with signs they even provide them the signs and all that too okay but the ones that are legitimately protesting I guarantee if they were taught the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program when they were going to school and they were given all these essential facts and they were shown all the information as they were growing up, they would not make the choice or it would be drastically reduced. I guarantee it. So I don't blame them. They weren't taught. We didn't offer them the information. We didn't offer them the moral guidance that we should have gave them. And what we told them was, well, it's legal. It's legal. But we didn't give them the rest of the information. So let's turn over now to page uh, uh, 140. I didn't mean to harp on that too long, but I, I, but I did. <laughs> um, and I got to find out where I'm at here. Say react, peer pressure, promise me. 
Okay, on let's go to LP5E, number eight. And that's the step we're on right now. It says, tell students that just like the other influences, peer pressure can be both positive and negative. Have students turn to page 138 and read the section, there are two sides to every coin. Emphasize that risk-taking behavior is a result of a lack of self-control. Instruct students to, and students to turn to section entitled, Be Your Own Person, found on, found on page 144. So you see there's a lot of pages missing between there, right? But, but it's talking about where it says, emphasize that risk-taking behavior is a result of lack of self-control. Well, page 140 and 141, 42, 43 are talking about those risk-taking behaviors. It's not said in here, but it's implied, okay? So let's go to page 140, drugs and alcohol. And let's put up that next slide so we can get a visual. Have you ever been drunk, smoked a joint, or even tried cigarettes? Yeah, all three at the same time. <laughs> and more, probably at the same time, right? If you're thinking to yourself, no way, I'm too young to drink and too smart to ruin my future by trying drugs or even smoking, then great for you. You are not a robot. No one can push your buttons. The problem, however, is that many teens are trying alcohol at an average age of 11 and marijuana at an average age of 12. And I've always marveled at that statement right there because that's exactly how old I was when I started smoking cigarettes and smoking marijuana and had my first beer. I remember we were, uh, me and my brothers and my friends were out unattended one afternoon or one morning and we were walking by an old El Camino. This was back in like 1971 probably. And, uh, and the, the whole El Camino, the back of the El Camino had beer. It was like, like you know, and we were like, wow, look at all this beer, right? You know, we're only, you know, eight, nine, ten years old. Ten, I think I was ten at the time. Let's see, 71, I would have been 11 because I was born in 62. But anyway, uh, we drank some beer and only took a couple to get drunk, I'm sure. My mom came looking for us, and we were all laying on the pavement. My brother crashed his bike, and she found us all. She found the beer cans. Where would you get this beer? Well, you know, we didn't know what it would do. You know, we just knew our parents drank, or my dad drank beer, so I thought, you know, what could it hurt? Now, we did steal it. That was something I shouldn't have done, too. Okay? But we ended up, that was my first time getting drunk when I was about 11 years old. So this is true. This, this age, this average age is true here. I can testify. It says, using alcohol or drugs at a young age has been attributed to many reasons, some of which are friends are doing it, to fit in and have a sense of belonging, curiosity, low self-worth, to feel grown up, to escape from problems, or just following along. Notice that the top two reasons for drying drugs and alcohol, or both, are the influence of peers and to have a sense of belonging. And even though you might use alcohol and drugs just to fit in, several serious problems arise. Okay, and this is where the fact gathering has to come in now. And we're going to go into this. I'm not going to rush through this. We need to really go into this deep to be able to understand better about these drugs and, and over drinking. First of all, drug use and underage drinking can easily result in loss of life. You know, and I know I hear these, you know, these people say, well, nobody dies from uh, smoking marijuana in car crashes. It's only drinking. You <laughs> know, well, that's not true. Okay. Uh, I know acid and other uh, drugs, too, cause you to lose reality. You're not even in reality, so I don't know how you can be in control of a, of a vehicle. Right, if you're driving on that, that kind of stuff. Okay, it says, first of all, drug use and underage drinking can easily result in loss of life. Taking recreational drugs seriously impairs the way your brain and other vital body functions operate on a, on a molecular level. I need you to underline that. Taking recreational drugs seriously impairs the way your brain and other vital body functions operate on a molecular level. Now, I have a video, and I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I need you to have your pens, because we, we're going to learn about vital body systems, okay? Because it's talking here about vital body systems. 
And there's 11 vital body systems. Let's go to the next slide just to give a graph, a visual here. There's 11 vital body systems. You have the circulatory, the digestive, the endocrine, excretory, integumentary, lymphatic and immune, muscular, nervous, reproductive, respiratory, and skeletal systems. What do they do? What, what is each one of their functions? We're about to find out. And I need you to write down, you know, in your book, so you can explain these things to students, so you can see how on a molecular level, these body systems are not able to operate correctly because of drugs and over drinking. So with that, let's go ahead and let's play the video. So we're going to intro the 11 major organ systems. Now, keep in mind, this is just a quick intro. So we're doing the bare bones, no pun intended, of the systems. And because they are all important, it's kind of hard to know where to start. So we're going to go in alphabetical order because we don't want you to think that one system is way more important than another. First, the circulatory system. You think of blood, and you should, because blood carries gases like oxygen, which your body needs, and helps remove carbon dioxide, which your body needs to expel. Your blood also transports nutrients that your body needs. Your heart is included in the system. It's a pumping machine that transports the blood around. Arteries are vessels that typically carry blood away from the heart. Think A4 away, and veins typically carry blood back to the heart. And capillaries are tiny blood vessels throughout your body. Did you ever hear this rumor that your blood is blue and then turns red when it reaches oxygen? Well, guess what? That's not really true. Your blood is red. It's always red, even inside your body, though the shade of red can vary slightly due to the amount of oxygen present. Veins may appear blue or even green to you through the skin, but it's actually related to the wavelengths of light, so do the Google for that. Okay, number two, the digestive system. It's important for breaking down and absorbing food for your body to get nutrients. Digestion actually starts in the mouth. You have some awesome enzymes in your saliva that get this process going. Your stomach contains acid, which furthers this process along. Your small intestine does most of the absorption of nutrients, and your large intestine has to reabsorb a lot of the water from this process. And just to note, there are a lot of accessory organs also involved in this fascinating process. Third, the endocrine system. You know how you're bigger than you were when you were six years old? Unless you are six years old. Growth hormone is a hormone that's made a big impact on you. Or another example, Notice how your heart starts to race when you have a big test that maybe you haven't studied for. Well, that's another hormone, adrenaline. The endocrine system includes many glands that secrete hormones like those examples. Another system that starts with E is number four, the excretory system. I like to think exit for excretory because this system is all about excreting waste. And I'm not talking about feces because that's still the digestive system, more like urine. This system involves your kidneys, which are in your lower back. The kidneys assist in removing waste from the blood. And you know they're important because anyone with impaired kidneys may need to go on a machine called dialysis to replace that function. The excretory system also includes other ways of removing waste, such as sweating. Okay, number five, the integumentary system. This long, fancy word, it's appropriate for your largest organ, your skin. Your skin helps protect your organs from outside damage. It helps with temperature regulation and from losing precious water. Number six, the lymphatic slash immune system. Has anyone ever checked your lymph nodes on your neck when you feel sick? Well, you have many lymph nodes and they tend to swell during some illnesses. See, lymph is this clear fluid from blood plasma. It surrounds your cells, and this system collects, filters, and returns the lymph to blood, and the major role is to help with immune function. This keeps your body safe against pathogens like viruses and bacteria. Structures like lymph nodes, the thymus, spleen, tonsils, and bone marrow, they all play a significant role in your immune system. Okay, so now we're more than halfway done with our intro, so hang in there. 
Number seven, the muscular system. No bones about it. Your bones can't do much without muscle to move them. You actually have three major types of muscle tissue, known as skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle. Number eight, the nervous system. Your body would be a nervous wreck without something to coordinate it. That always helps me remember it. The nervous system includes your brain and your spinal cord. It controls voluntary actions. That's what you can control, like picking up a pencil. And involuntary actions, the ones you can't control, such as reflexes. At the cellular level, the nervous system uses cells known as neurons. With their amazing structure, these cells are kind of the cool cells on the block. Number nine, the reproductive system. Like it sounds, this system includes reproductive organs. The major function here is that it allows for animals to reproduce. So think babies. Number 10, the respiratory system. This involves the lungs, and this system involves the intake of oxygen into the body and exhaling carbon dioxide from the body. Remember that your cells need this oxygen, and they need to get rid of carbon dioxide in order to function correctly. Number 11, the skeletal system, bones. Adults have 206 bones, and you had more at birth, but some bones, they fuse together, and these bones support you, they protect your organs, think rib cage, and they even produce blood cells from the bone marrow that's inside the bone. Okay, so hopefully you were able to take a few notes to, to, to get, uh, you could take that last slide back up again, please, the, the, uh, the one I was showing about the circulatory, there you go. If you didn't have an opportunity to write those down, go ahead and write them down while I'm talking. Um, you know, it's very important in the peaceful solution that if we're going to be given information to some, you know, because a student might ask you, you know, well, what is what is vital body systems? Vital body systems isn't talking about vital organs. It's talking about systems. <laughs> you know, you have vital organs like you have your heart, your brain, your kidneys, your liver. Uh, I think there's like five vital organs. I'm trying to remember the other one. But, uh. Vital body systems is a whole different it was a whole different thing. So we really need to be to try to educate ourselves as much as possible about these things so we can, you know, when we're asked questions, you know, we can be knowledgeable about these things. And we when we're talking about drugs and over drinking, drugs and alcohol, we need to realize first of all all these systems, how they operate and how the drugs and alcohol impair the ability of those systems to operate and how they damage those systems, you know, long and short term. Okay? Because many of the, a lot of the damage that comes from using drugs and alcohol, you don't see it right away. Now, you see the effects of drugs, you know, because you, you're high or you're hallucinating or whatever might, might be the case. But you don't always see the damage that it does to your body and to your brain until later on in life. Okay? So we need to keep these things in mind. We've got to uh, educate ourselves to the best of our abilities so we can pass these things on to our students. And uh, in my final couple minutes here, it says, Now, taking recreational drugs seriously impairs the way your brain and other vital body systems operate on a molecular level. And that means, mole, you know, you're on, at the, in the DNA, the molecular level, the, you know, that you can't see. You have to have a microscope to be able to see these things, okay? So, you know, it's kind of like we taught the peaceful solution about, you know, can you look at somebody and know they have an STD? You know, well, if you're trained to discern certain uh, things might start coming out like certain sometimes people have outbreaks where you can determine yeah that's herpes because i see that sore right here doesn't mean it's always herpes it could be uh, uh some other thing but a lot of times it is herpes um so you can be trained to discern those things but you don't always see them because people don't always have outbreaks so you, a person could look perfectly healthy and normal but their body could be filled with disease Okay, so you can't, remember, you can't judge based on what you see. You have to get, remember, you have, personality is the outer appearance. You know, we got to look behind the veil. We got to look behind things to see what's really behind. 
that, that what we see. We can't just go by, you know, appearance in any way, shape, or form. Remember, always get the facts and make sure they're correct, they're true, before making a decision. That's where we're going to have to stop right there in, uh, in the middle of page 140. We'll pick up right there about where it says recreational drugs. And uh, uh, the next class, I believe, is going to be 6-10-2022 at 5.30 p.m. That'll be on Sunday. Oh, man, we're going back in time. <laughs> okay, no, it's 7-10-2022 at 5.30 p.m. Central Time. I hope you'll join us and go over, the, go over this information again, and we'll be ready to pick up next time. So with that, thank you very much, and have a great evening.